Oh, there we go. Good evening. I'm Drew Griffin, a senior librarian here at the library. And I want to welcome you to the second talk in Our Path Forward, a series presented by the Cambridge Public Library to affirm its commitment to public discourse and democracy. Our director, Maria McCauley, put it eloquently last month. Public libraries, she stated, are engines of democracy, places to build a stronger, better informed, more inclusive and free society. I would just like to take a moment to mention two further events happening next month. On Wednesday, May 17th at 6.30 in the community room, my colleagues from Adult Services will be offering a workshop on fake news and media literacy, guiding us on how to navigate the information landscape and avoid spreading fake news. And on Saturday, May 20th at 10 a.m. in the Joan Lorenz Park, the park out in front of the library, Join us for Democracy Day, a live participatory public reading and celebration of the Constitution, along with performances, activities, and more. Families are most welcome. It is both a personal pleasure and a professional privilege to introduce our guest tonight, Ambassador Nicholas Burns. If you watch the news, and let's be honest, we all watch the news these days. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot to say if you could all please silence your cell phones. <laughs> I'm sure you have seen him. His diplomatic demeanor, unflappable and reassuring, appear regularly on the major uh, network and cable news outlets. For 27 years, Ambassador Burns was in the Foreign Service, and since 2008, he has been the Roy and Barbara Goodman Family Professor of International Relations. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I messed that up. I knew I would. These long titles these days. Uh, professor of the Practice of Diplomacy in International Relations at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School. For the past 75 plus years, the United States has held a unique role in the world. And during those years, the State Department has stood at the forefront of that international role. We have never been simply or even chiefly a military power. One need only recall the Marshall Plan. We are caught, Martin Luther King wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail, in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. destiny Whatever affects one of us directly affects all indirectly. Our decisions matter. Which department should guide our response to the world, state or defense? Do we even need a robust state department? What exactly should be our relationship with our European allies, with NATO, with Russia? Should we re relinquish our current role in the world? And what are the consequences of our decisions here, both for us and for the rest of the world? Herein lie the challenges facing the current administration and really all of us as well. Our guest this evening brings a broad range of expertise to help us sort through these challenges. Ambassador Burns served under both Republican and Democratic presidents. As the, as the director for Soviet and then Russian affairs for President George H.W. Bush, and as the senior director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia affairs uh, for President Clinton. In Clinton's second term, he was ambassador to Greece, and then under President George W. Bush, ambassador to NATO. He has served at the highest levels of the State Department finishing his career as the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, the Foreign Service's highest office. We could not find a more knowledgeable authority. But Nick is one of us, a local product, raised in Wellesley, a graduate of Wellesley High School and Boston College, a diehard Red Sox fan, 
and a resident of our fair city. Please join me in welcoming our uh, fellow Canterburyan, Ambassador Nicholas Burns. Drew, thank you very much. That was a wonderful introduction. I appreciate it very much, and good evening, everybody. Um, what Drew didn't tell you is that he has a wonderful son, Dylan, who grew up here in Cambridge, went to Belmont Hill, went to Wesleyan, and there met my equally wonderful niece, Becca, and they are married. And so, uh, <laughs> so, so we are related now. We're part of the same extended family, and we couldn't be more, be more pleased. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here. When Drew uh, called me and asked me to come over to speak, I wanted to do it because we, my wife Libby and I feel a newfound loyalty to Cambridge. I did grow up in Wellesley, Mass, and two of my high school friends are right here in the front row, <laughs> Sudie Gifford and Dottie Duffy. Um, and then Libby and I, after I was at Boston College, we left for 30 years. We went to D.C. for graduate school. We lived around the world in Mauritania, West Africa, on one end of the Sahara Desert. Then we moved to Cairo in Egypt on the other end of the Sahara Desert, then to Israel, uh, to Greece and Belgium, and a lot of time in Washington. Uh, but Thomas Wolfe was wrong. You can come home again. <laughs> And we did, not to Wellesley, but Cambridge in 2009, and we love it here. We love the blue bubble. <laughs> we love the uh, People's Republic of Cambridge aspect <laughs> of life here. We do. And uh, we live in Huron Village. Our local uh, place is Formaggio Kitchen or High Rise. You all know those two <laughs> iconic places. If you've lived in Huron Village the last four plus years, however, <laughs> Our streets have been eternally dug up, filled in, and dug up again. And if you live on near Huron or Concord, life has been unpleasant. But the contrast of this is just the incredible nature of this city. Extremely well run. I think the renaissance that Cambridge is in, on one end, Kendall Square, and the extraordinary biotech revolution Probably the leading biotech center in the world right now is Kendall Square, MIT, Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's going to produce jobs, but it's also going to produce our future, hopefully a positive future. I think it will be a positive future through technology, through this incredible marriage of ideas developed at MIT and Harvard and other places, and then venture capital and private equity, turning it into products, turning it into businesses where people can work and feel proud of what they do. And I think that renaissance is also uh, evident in this beautiful common that's been remade if you've walked through the Cambridge Common, that wonderful Civil War statue, the wonderful statue of Lincoln, the beautiful grounds. And then Cambridge really came home to us yesterday morning. We live on Blakesley Street, this little street near Formaggio, and there was a horrible fire, four houses down from us, and thank goodness no one was harmed. Students living in the upper floors got out. But the entire building succumbed to this extraordinary inferno. And um, we saw the incredible heroism of the Cambridge Fire Department. These, these men uh, and women went up on ladders above the house, shot water down into the house. I mean, it was risky. It was brave, it was courageous, and you just couldn't be prouder to live in a town where people are willing to risk their lives for their fellow citizens. So this is my ode to Cambridge. I'm here tonight to talk about, not Cambridge, <laughs> but a different subject, foreign policy in the age of Trump, of President Trump, President Donald Trump. But there's a subtitle that I fashioned in my harried Uber ride from Boston College to here um, that I want to tell you about. Uh, the subtitle is from Twelfth Night, from Shakespeare. What country, friends, is this? And I think that's a question we should ponder as we think about our election, the incredible year of 2016, 
about America's role in the world, which was my subject tonight, about our purpose in the world, what we stand for, who we are, what country, friends, is this? And that's not my title, that's Shakespeare's line, obviously, beautifully composed line. But it was also the subject of a lecture given tonight over at Boston College by my, one of my mentors, Professor Mark O'Connor, and he's taught there for 43 years. And I met him on, in September 1974 when I was an 18-year-old freshman from Wellesley High School. And he's been one of my closest friends since, and this was his last lecture tonight after 43 years of teaching thousands of Boston College students. And that was the title of his last lecture. What country, friends, is this? And when I think about the challenges that President Trump is facing and that we're facing, all of us as Americans, it's really to answer that question. Because that's what's at stake, in my view. And as Drew said, you know, for 27 years, I was not permitted to have publicly expressed views divergent from my own government, and that's proper. Civil servants, people who serve our government, military officers, diplomats, need to serve loyally, need not to criticize publicly, although we do have a democratic debate inside the government, obviously, we disagree a lot. Um, but now that I'm out of office, <laughs> I can express my views. And I think that's what is at stake. Because we're a great country in large part because our greatness rests in our values. We believe in freedom of the press in the First Amendment. We believe in the separation of powers and the, the ability of the judiciary to tell the president that he's wrong or he's acting in an unconstitutional or illegal way, as we've seen in recent weeks. We believe in the enlightenment values that underwrite the history of this country. David Brooks in the New York Times wrote a beautiful article a couple of weeks ago saying what he thought was at stake was even the enlightenment values of science and empiricism and logic and reason in an America now that has a government in some parts, at least with its leader, saying things that just aren't true or contesting facts that are true and trying to lead us astray through myth. And that's why we had the Enlightenment. And that's why Hamilton and Jay and Jefferson believed that we had to be grounded in fact and in science. So what kind of country are we? I didn't think we need to be, needed to be made great again. I think we've been great. Not universally great. I was over at our new beautiful Harvard, renewed Harvard Art Museum's last Thursday night, and Ken Burns showed, the great Ken Burns, no relation, so I can say that, <laughs> showed his, a montage of his newest 18-part series on Vietnam, which is going to dominate our PBS watching next September and October, 18-part series on Vietnam. That was not a brilliant decision by presidents to put hundreds of thousands of Americans into Vietnam, see 58,000 dead, many more thousands wounded, over a million Vietnamese whose lives perished in a 13-year war. The Iraq War of 2003 was not part of the greatness of America. But there are so many other examples of our greatness in our history. From, this is April 19th, from Lexington and Concord in the Battle for our future, to liberate ourselves from empire. To Lincoln, our greatest president, who fought a war. It's interesting if you travel around New England cemeteries, as my wife and I have done. Went to South Hadley, to Mount Holyoke a couple of years ago. Their Civil War monument doesn't talk about the Civil War. It talks about freeing the slaves and preserving the Union. And on that monument, it says the War of the Southern Rebellion. And Lincoln put it down and preserved the Union and freed the slaves. And then Martin Luther King, a century later, came along and redeemed the promise of Lincoln through the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 5. That's the greatness of America. We saw it in the Cold War, when for four and a half decades, and I'll bet there are people in the audience who were part of this, American soldiers went over and held the line against Soviet communism and held the promise that Germany might be reunited at some point that the 115 to 20 million East Europeans would be liberated from the Warsaw Pact and brought into democratic societies. American soldiers, American diplomats, American presidents of both parties 
believed in that greatness of America. But apart from our wars and what we do in foreign policy, the greatness is in our multi-ethnic, multi-religious society of immigrants, e pluribus unum, we build one country. We're a great country. And we didn't need to be told we needed to be great again by going backwards on the environment or ditching the climate change agreement or telling women that they can't control their own futures through reproductive rights. We didn't need, I think, to go back. So this subtitle of my friend, Professor Mark O'Connor, what kind of country is this? What shall we be? Is really the task for all of us as Americans, I think, to reflect on and to fight for in a peaceful, civil way in our democracy. I think that's what's at stake uh, in this spring of 2017. I want to just give you some thoughts about our foreign policy direction. And then I'm going to stop. And I would be very happy to have a conversation with anybody who wants to speak. You can ask a question, but you can also argue with me. I tell my students that over at the Kennedy School, please argue with me. Please disagree with me. That's what a university is for. There is no orthodoxy here. And I don't mean to profess orthodoxy this evening. But let me start on the foreign policy front by saying, I think President Trump is facing, and I think President Obama did, and President George W. Bush as well, the most complex foreign policy agenda that Americans have faced probably since the Second World War. And since I don't want to be guilty of exaggeration and of overstatement, it's not the most fateful time in American history. That was 242 years ago at Lexington and Concord. Not the most dangerous time, that was Lincoln's struggle between April 1860 and April 1865 to preserve a democratic union where slavery did not ultimately exist. And in World War II, uh, our parents' generation, just looking at the three of us who graduated together from Wellesley High School, well, they put 16 million men and women in uniform, 16 million, between 1941 and 1945 to help liberate Europe from fascism, Asia from totalitarianism, and despite some of the mistakes we've made in the ensuing 72 years, the United States has kept and preserved this liberal world order that we see in Europe and Asia that has driven a world at peace among the superpowers for seven decades, which is quite an accomplishment. But this is a complex time. How do, where do we see the complexity? We see it in climate change. We see it in trafficking of women and children. We see it in global crime cartels and drug cartels. We see it in the spread of pandemics from SARS to Ebola to Zika. We see it in world food shortages. Four countries now, the United Nations believes in Former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is our guest at Harvard for these three months. He spoke to my students this morning. He told my students four countries are in famine in April 2017, in the Middle East and in Africa. We, have, we live in a world where these transnational problems that I just mentioned, and there are a thousand others like them, are traveling under our borders and over our borders and th through our borders in a globalized world. Some of that globalization is virtuous. Our ability to spread ideas and education and science and technology to improve other people's lives. But some of it's quite negative. If you don't pay attention to climate change or you walk away from your responsibilities and you're the largest carbon emitter, as we are with China, then you understand that if you don't get in the same boat with everyone else and pull in the same oar, we're not going to resolve any of these big transnational problems. And I think increasingly, if you've looked at our modern diplomacy over the last two or three decades, President Clinton and President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama and now President Donald Trump, they have to be coalition builders. There's one coalition for climate. That's 195 countries. That's everybody. There's another coalition to respond to pandemics. There's a third coalition to try to respond to famine. There's another coalition to try to help mediate civil wars. And the Americans, because we have the largest and most successful economy, we have by far the most capable and powerful military. We are, and this is all sounding very arrogant, if you're not American, excuse me, but I think these are objective facts. We're still the most influential country politically 
We have to be among the leaders that pull these coalitions together. And we can't think, as 18th century Americans did, that somehow we can live isolated, resplendent in our isolation from the problems of the world. This is very Jeffersonian. This was Jefferson's argument with Hamilton. Jefferson said, perfect our democracy at home. The Atlantic and Pacific will protect us. Let's not be infected by the sins of the empires from which we just liberated ourselves. But Hamilton, I think, even then understood we have to live in the world. You have to have a powerful central bank. You have to have a powerful government and military and diplomacy to play your part. What kind of country should we be is an engaged country that works with other countries, that doesn't always think America first and America only. Of course we want the best for our country. My job in every administration in which I serve, the job of all of us who serve in public life on a national and international level is to serve the interests of the United States. But I think our most visionary presidents, think of Franklin Roosevelt in his deathbed, April 12, 1945, had this vision that out of the Second World War, would come a United Nations that we would actually go out and stay out beyond our shores to help mend up the wounds of World War II. This horrific conflict where 60 million people had died, where there were 80 to 90 million refugees in 1945. That was an outward vision. Barack Obama felt the same way when he decided to have a joint venture partnership with Xi Jinping on climate change. We have to be in the world. We have to be working for the world. That's an America first strategy. America first doesn't have to be retreat back into 50 states and build walls, dig moats, pull up drawbridges, pull the covers over our heads, don't want to be bothered with the problems of the world. The thing about the 21st century is those problems will come home to America. I mean, Zika is going to fly over the walls, right? Come right over the walls, no matter how high you build the walls. And we found out on 9-11. It wasn't a government. It wasn't a sophisticated military that attacked us. In the words of Tom Friedman, the New York Times columnist, he said, a bunch of guys attacked us, 21. They hatched their plot in Hamburg. They stayed in a motel, Soldier's Field Road the night before they boarded planes at Logan to fly them into buildings in New York and Washington. This is a completely different world we live in. And the idea that somehow we can escape from it is fatuous and illusory and naive and destructive for what the United States needs to do in the world. So this extraordinary complex set of problems, and I'm going to depress you further. <laughs> and I apologize for this, but I'm going to end with hope. In addition to those transnational problems in the inbox, I think that President Trump and President Obama and President Bush would agree there are three big global challenges for America out there. One is a weakening Europe. Second is a fractured, violent, almost dystopian Middle East. And the third is this huge challenge of Asia, the future, and how we balance partnership and competition with China. Let me just say a word about each, because I think if you, if you try to track where President Trump and President Obama spend their time, it's on those three problems. Not to the exclusion of problems in our own hemisphere, or in Africa, or in South Asia. But let's start with Europe. It's our largest trade partner. It's the largest investor into our economy. It's the greatest number of American allies in the world. 28 European allies are with Canada and the United States in NATO. What happens there really matters. And Europe, which had been such a huge success story 10, 15 years ago with the success of the European Union, with the end of the Cold War, with the rise of a democratic just continent, is really struggling now. Brexit, that Donald Trump celebrated, that said was the right decision. Well, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is the second largest economy in the EU, and it leaves 24 months from now because Prime Minister Theresa May has started the clock under Article 50 of the European Union, the negotiations, the divorce proceedings, the negotiations to leave. That second largest economy will be out of the greatest economic union of the world, 500 million people in the largest single market. Britain's out. Britain's also the strongest military. And Britain 
without any question, is the most globally oriented of all the European countries, much more so than Germany or France. It has the commonwealth. It has the mentality that it needs to be globally oriented. It will be out, and that's going to affect the strength of the European Union, and we should be rooting for the success of the European Union, not for its defeat, as our president has also done. That's one big problem. A lot of my British friends worry that when they do leave, Scotland will try to hold a second referendum. This is Nicola Sturgeon of the Scottish National Party, a very able political leader, and that the people of Scotland could vote to leave because they're very EU-centric. And they're about as big, five million people, as either Norway or Denmark. And I'm like many people in this city. And in the Boston area, Irish-American. I have two grandparents who came over to East Boston, the Golden Staircase, as immigrants. Well, now the Irish question has been reopened after 100 years. The great battle of 1916-1922 was for Irish freedom and also one Ireland. And of course, Ireland's been divided. Jerry Adams might very well reflect after Brexit, it's time to reopen the Irish question and unite Northern Ireland with the Republic of Ireland, because the Northern Irish are EU-oriented. So will the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, put together in 1707 by the Act of Union, become the United Kingdom of England and Wales 10 years from now? I hope not, because we have no better friend in Europe, and no better friend in the world than the UK. And that's just one of the problems. If you add to that, the fact that there are more than 1.2 million refugees that have been invited and accepted into European countries, but have really overwhelmed, in some cases, the capacity of those countries to receive them adequately. And if you add to that the rise of right-wing populism, just visualize in your mind Marine Le Pen denying the Holocaust last week and the Vichy government's complicity, direct complicity with Goebbels and with Eichmann in rounding up the Jews of France and sending them to death camps, cavorting with Putin two weeks ago in the Kremlin, accepting loans from Russian state banks. She says she'll take France out of the European Union. She'll destroy the EU bloc. She's not a Democrat, small d. She doesn't believe what we believe, or what most French believe, and yet she's probably going to get to the second round of the French presidential elections in the first weekend in May, and she could win. And that will be a disaster. And to see the rise of right-wing populism in Germany with the alternative for Deutschland, they're not going to win, but they're significant. Geert Wilders in the Netherlands, the fascist government, I would use that word advisedly, of Viktor Orban in Hungary, the right-wing nationalism in Poland. We're not exactly back in the 1930s, but the Europeans are frightened that anti-democratic movements are on the march again. And then they have Putin preying upon their borders. If I had bought a, brought a map, just picture the Russian Federation south. Putin invading Georgia in 2008, keeping Moldova off balance. This is from the south to the west of the Russian Federation. Invading Crimea and annexing it, doing something that no European leader had done since Hitler and Mussolini, stealing someone else's land and keeping the Donbass and eastern Ukraine divided and harassing the Baltic states in the north. Europe is under siege. It needs an American president and government that will be dedicated to its preservation, that we will come to their help as they came to our help on 9-11 when we invoked Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, when the European allies said, we'll stand with you, we'll go to Afghanistan. They all did, and they're still there. And they're not feeling the love and support from Washington that I think any prior American president would have given them, from Franklin Roosevelt to Barack Obama. That's problem number one. Problem number two is the Middle East, and I'm going to be mercifully brief because we'd need a Harvard University course of five years running to do justice to the Middle East, but just a few data points to describe what's happened. You remember how you felt in January of 2011 when the Arab Spring started. We no longer call it the Arab Spring. But people felt hopeful, even people who'd lived in these countries, who knew these countries, because these were peaceful revolutions. They were led by young people. They were really about jobs and freedom, really important things in people's lives. And we thought maybe a glimmer of hope 
that some of these young people could succeed. What's the report card? Six years later. Six years and three months later. I would say maybe Morocco and Tunisia are better off of the 22 Arab states, but all the others worse off, destabilized, some of them fractured. Libya is a failed state, divided, really no central government, five tribes fighting for power. Yemen's the victim of a proxy war between the great Sunni power, Saudi Arabia, the great Shia power, Iran. Iraq is divided probably permanently in three parts, a Shia-dominated, Iranian-dominated Baghdad and Basra in the south, an autonomous Kurdish region in the east and north, and then Anbar province still owned and controlled by the Islamic State, which moved in nearly three years ago and imposed its draconian, I would even say evil, nihilistic vision of the world on these poor suffering Sunnis in Anbar province. And the American military and Iraqi military trying to take back Mosul, the second largest city in the country after Baghdad. And then we'll have to go on to Raqqa in northern Syria because Islamic State controls territory on both sides of the border. That's Iraq. And then Syria. Think, again, I should have brought a map. Maps really help. But think where it is. Who are the neighbors of Syria? Jordan. Iraq, Turkey, Lebanon, Israel. It's a keystone state. The pre-war population was 22.4 million Syrians. And now the United Nations believes that more than 12 million of them are homeless. So just think about that for a moment. Think about any country in the world, including our own country, with more than half the population homeless. The numbers in Syria are that 7 million people are homeless inside the country. They're on the run. They've been blasted out of their homes by the merciless bombing of the Russian and Syrian air forces. They're trying to dodge the Islamic State, Jabhat al-Nusra, various hundreds of other Sunni rebel groups. If you're Sunni or Kurd or Shia, someone wants to kill you in this fratricidal sectarian war. There are five million people outside the country as refugees in Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon. In Lebanon, one of every two kids in the school system are Syrian refugee kids. And then, of course, this incredible human exodus beginning in September, October 2015 that went on for four or five months of people trying to escape across the eastern Aegean Sea from Turkey to Greece, making their way from Greek islands, walking up the spine of Europe, the Balkans, being, having doors slammed in their face. And this is hundreds of thousands of people walking in the autumn of 2015 as the Serbs and the Macedonians and the Albanians and then the Hungarians saying we are Christian societies, we don't want Muslims. And the doors were shut, but Angela Merkel, Lutheran pastor's daughter, who knew what it was to live in an unfree country, East Germany, welcomed them. She paid a political price. The poll numbers went down. The Social Democrats believe they can now defeat her. But for me, what a luminous human decision to say, I'm going to use the power of my country to open our doors and take in hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees. And the German people have tried mightily to assimilate them, as did the French. And after the two terrorist attacks in Paris, what did President Hollande do? He said, we'll double the number of Syrian refugees, double. What did Justin Trudeau do? Will double the number of Syrian refugees. Canada has taken in 50,000 refugees. How many has the United States taken in? Anybody know? About 12,500. So Germany takes in more than a million. We take 12,500. That was President Obama. President Trump has come to say he's vilified the refugees. He's demonized the refugees. They're a source of evil, trouble, they're potential terrorists. Well, here's the data. We've taken in 800,000 refugees from all around the world since 9-11. And not a single one of those people has launched a terrorist attack against an American city or an American house or an American citizen. Some of them have gotten into trouble. Many of them have probably violated the law. They're not perfect. But most of these refugees, and I, as a young officer in Cairo and Rome, I interviewed refugees back in the 1980s. We know everything about these people. 
We vet them. It takes 18 to 24 months to get into this country. We know them. They're mainly families. They're people with kids. They want to give their kids a chance. And in our immigrant-based culture, and if we went around the room and everybody told their story, we don't need to go back more than two or three generations, and we have an immigrant or a refugee in most of our family stories here. So we have an obligation, but also a self-interest, to help keep Europe and the Middle East stable, but we're not doing our part. And my friend David Miliband, who runs our largest refugee organization, the International Rescue Committee in New York City, came to Harvard last week at our invitation. He spoke to our students, and he reminded us that in every refugee crisis since World War II, in every single one, the United States normally takes half of all the refugees that the UN says need to be resettled. Why? Because we're the strongest, largest country, we're the wealthiest country, and we are multi-ethnic and multi-religious. I happen to be white and Christian, Catholic, but I know that's not what every American is or needs to be. And so when we face an administration where at least some people in it, like Steve Bannon, say, we're a white country, we're a white Christian country. No, we're Muslim, and Jewish, and we're Hindus, and we're Christians, and we're atheists, and agnostics, and a hundred other religions in between. That's who we are. And so a refugee ban, an immigration ban, the refugee ban of President Trump says we will take in no refugees. There are 65 million refugees and displaced people in the world today. It's the greatest number since 1945. And our president is saying, we're closing the doors. We have effectively a Muslim ban in place. But we also have courageous judges in Hawaii, in Oregon, who say this is not right, it's not legal, and we're going to suspend your order. And let's see how the courts decide this. Boy, do the Europeans and the Middle Easterners need our help in these two parts of the world. And then finally, Asia. And I think for the younger people here, and certainly the younger people, the millennials with whom I hang around at Harvard, all our students, what we say to them, most of us, is all these problems are important, but the biggest challenge we're going to face in the next 50 years, so this is our kids and our grandchildren, and maybe our great-grandchildren, will be to answer the following question. How do we live in peace with China, work with China, be a partner with China, and yet not be dominated by China? My friend Stephen Bosworth passed away in December 2015. Dean at Tufts for 11 years of the Fletcher School. Came at the end of his career to teach with us at Harvard. He came into my classroom two years ago, two and a half years ago. And he said to my students, the United States has faced exceptional challenges in our 242 years of existence. He says this question of how we relate to China, he said it'll be the most difficult thing we've ever done. Full stop. I said, Professor, did you just say the most difficult thing we've ever done, more difficult than the Revolution, Civil War, World War II? He said, yes. He said, because the stakes are too high. And here's how Steve framed it. He said, on most of these transnational issues that we talked about, climate change, trafficking of human beings, crime and drug cartels, pandemics, famine. The most capable other country to lead with us is China because of their unbelievable economic strength, their great national capacity, the brilliance of the Chinese people, and, and how they view the world. So on a lot of these questions, we're going to have to be partners, he said, with China. He said, but here's the rub. We're competing for military power with China right now. After the end of the Second World War, we stayed in Japan. We still have 35,000 American forces there, major air bases, major naval bases. We are in just south of the demilitarized zone, the most dangerous place on Earth right now. Vice President Pence was just there. 25,000 American troops, 10 million South Koreans living 30 kilometers south of the DMZ in Seoul, and a million North Korean soldiers. We're back in Australia. MacArthur retreated all the way to Australia from the Philippines in 42. We're back in Darwin, the US Marines. We have security agreements with the Philippines and Thailand. We're security partners with Singapore, I should have brought the map, and Malaysia and India. And for Americans of a certain age, 
and Sudi and Dadi and I turned 17 the year the Vietnam War ended, it is surreal to listen to the Vietnamese who say to us now, please come back to Cam Ranh Bay. Bring your Navy and Air Force back. We want to work with you because we, thought, we fought you for 13 years. We've been struggling against Chinese power for 1,000 years. And, and what Ambassador Bosworth told my students is the truth. It would be insane and catastrophic to ever fight China for both of us. In the nuclear weapons age, we would destroy the world 10 times over. And yet we need to preserve the democracies, the independence of these, these great countries in East Asia. We are their great ally. And so how do you be someone's most important partner and most important competitor at the same time? If that's the Bosworth challenge, well, it may be one of the most difficult things we've ever done. What kind of traits will we need in our leadership to accomplish that? And I'm talking 30, 40, 50 years into the future. This is, like a, this is a version of John F. Kennedy's long twilight struggle. It's different. It's engaging and defending at the same time. We're going to need presidents and secretaries of defense and state and chairmen of chair people, men and women of the Joint Ch Chiefs of Staff who understand history, who understand leadership, who understand the nuances of problems who can drill 10 layers deep, who just not possess IQ, but EQ. I thought one of the most extraordinary things President Obama did is he really tried to get to know Xi Jinping, the other most important and powerful person in the world. And President Obama had a great sense of the competition. He said we need to pivot to Asia. He wants to build up, he wanted to build up our air bases, Guam and Australia. Japan and South Korea, but he also wanted to work with Xi Jinping, and they chose climate change. It was the very first U.S.-Chinese joint venture, and they led the world, the two largest carbon emitters, to the Paris Agreement of 2015, the very agreement the Trump administration is debating. Read Coral Davenport's great article in the New York Times this morning. Should we leave it or not? Leave it. If you think the science is anywhere close to being true, and I'm an acceptor, not a denier, then we've got to stay in this. The thing about climate change is you need every country in the world, you need 7.5 billion people in the world, not a slice of the world, to do something about it. <clears throat> Two, as President Obama and President Bush before him, by the way, were trying to do, get off carbon, kick the habit, listen to our scientists and engineers, fund their basic research so we can live in a clean energy world and produce an entirely new economic structure based on clean energy. And now we're going back to the 1950s by destroying the EPA and taking away the funding and putting people in charge of several of the government agencies who do not believe in the mission of those agencies. In Bannon's terms, we're going to deconstruct the administrative state, whatever that means. So the stakes are so high for us right now. My final point would be this, and forgive the length of this, because we will get to our discussion. The problem we've got is that the Trump team, and this is just an objective statement, is the most inexperienced team we've had in decades. The president is the very first president of all of our presidents from Washington to Trump with no prior experience in government, in public service, in public life, or in the military. All of our presidents have had some aspect of that. So he's, he's going to require some time to learn the job, and this is a very tough and demanding job. So I think we need to give him a little bit of space, because he may be a very different president six months from now, two years from now, than he is now. That's the, that's the hope. They've also very consciously not filled a lot of positions. They've only filled 25 or so senior positions out of 586. It's either the slowest transition in world history, or it's a deliberate attempt to kind of decimate the government and just not fill the jobs. I was up in my old agency about a month ago, the State Department, seven floors, our leadership floor, with the Secretary of State, the Deputy Secretary, the Undersecretary sit. I went to visit a friend of mine, I shouldn't name him. Uh, it was like a ghost ship. Secretary Tillerson's office was there. One other office, every other office literally empty. Our leadership structure is Secretary of State, Deputy Secretary, there's no Deputy Secretary, five Undersecretaries, there's one. 
and about 20 assistant secretaries. Those are our line managers, not a single person identified for the job. We've never had a transition like this. And you can't run a government if you're the greatest power unless you've got women and men who are capable of running it. That's problem number one. Problem number two is they're deeply divided. You've all been reading about this. It's like Shakespeare. And you, you seem to have two factions. You've got this radical right faction led by Steve Bannon, whom I've never met, so I don't want to demonize him, but just take him at his word. He seems to be a white Christian nationalist. He seems to believe that the state is the problem, that government is the problem. This is Ronald Reagan on steroids. Remember Ronald Reagan's statement, the government's the problem. I never thought the government was the problem when I served in government. Um, and then you, he has taken the reins and was the most influential person in the first two months. But recently, in the last month, we've seen a different Trump and different people behind him. A Trump who now says things that are the opposite of what he campaigned on, which is good. <laughs> because he now thinks that NATO's okay. And he now says that, you know, maybe we should be talking to China, not just questioning the one China policy. This is progress. And I think those of us who've opposed Donald Trump, and I opposed him in the campaign, have to say, good, thank you. Thank you for shifting. Thank you for being adaptive. Thank you for having the courage to change your views. Why? Because Rex Tillerson and Jim Mattis and Secretary Kelly from Boston, Massachusetts, Chairman Dunford from Boston, Massachusetts, they are moderate conservative people. But they're people who believe in government. They believe in working with other countries. They don't believe in tearing down the structure. They believe in reforming and rebuilding it. They're the adults. And, it see, and H.R. McMaster, the National Security Advisor, it seems that they're getting their way. And they're led by a 36-year-old with no prior experience in government. I've never met him either, named Jared Kushner. And he cannot be fired because he's the president's son-in-law. And if, if the Kushner faction wants to win the heart and mind of Donald Trump and bring him somewhere towards the center right, it's a better place than as far off the political spectrum to the right as we can see, which is where he was when he started on January 20th. I hope that moderate establishment, to use the dreaded E word, establishment is probably supposedly the enemy these days. I've never, I don't believe that that's the case. What is Donald Trump trying to do? He's questioned the value of our alliances. I think that NATO and our East Asian alliance is the great power differential between us and China and Russia. The Chinese and Russians don't have allies. And we have 20 allies in the world who will fight for us, die with us, and work with us diplomatically, and be loyal with us. He's questioning the value of free trade. We've been a trading nation. Think of Salem, Massachusetts, and Newburyport, and Marblehead, and Gloucester, and the history of Boston. We've been a sailing maritime trading nation since the very beginning. And yet Donald Trump has shut down all of our trade agreements, questioning NAFTA, which has been a resounding success, questioning the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 40% of global GDP. We'd write the rules of trade, not China, questioning our free trade agreement with the EU that President Obama had proposed. That's the second thing. And third are the immigrants and refugee issue that I talked about earlier. These are profound and consequential changes. Even if, in terms of the veneer of the administration, we might go from hard right to center right, even if the Kushner faction wins, these are policies that would turn on its head 70 years of Republican orthodoxy, much less Democratic Party orthodoxy. But I think the problem is more complicated than this. Because we look at these big consequential changes in policy that we'll have to debate as citizens. But we also look at the temperament of a leader. I mean, think of the incredible temperament of Harry Truman. My friend David Ignatius wrote a beautiful column this morning in the Washington Post saying it was really the values and honesty and maturity of Truman that brought us the Marshall Plan and brought us the steeliness to relieve the Berlin crisis of 1948. Contrast that with a president, a new president, and here who he's picked public fights with, not Vladimir Putin, by the way, uh, the president of Mexico, the prime minister of Australia, 
the President of France, the Prime Minister of Sweden, and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. That's quite a record. I don't remember any prior president who picked public fights with our best friends and then refuses to say as recently as last week that Vladimir Putin himself is a problem in Eastern Europe. Temperament's so important as a quality in leadership. Will he be an adaptive leader? Will he learn to adapt to a different reality? It's very different running a family office on two floors of a building in New York for 40 years, successfully, to running this multi-trillion dollar, multi-person conglomeration called the United States government with our balance of powers, dealing with 195 other nation states. And finally, can we adhere to Daniel Patrick Moynihan's famous adage, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And the ability to speak truthfully and honestly and objectively to the people of America is a fundamental responsibility of any public leader, much less the President of the United States. I also think that it's one thing to ring the village bell and say we're being assaulted by terrorism. Fair enough, we are being assaulted in the Middle East by the rise of terrorism. But our greatest leaders also had a positive, hopeful, optimistic view of America itself. Washington did, and Lincoln certainly did, our greatest president, and FDR definitely did. Ronald Reagan did and Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and George W. Bush did. It can't be all just dystopian. It can't be all division and fear and we fear the other and demonize the other because they look and act and preach and pray differently than we do. Our greatest leaders unite us and find the common threads that unite us as a country and people and our polyglot nation. And that's not what our present president's doing. So where I hope he's going to go, I hope where he adapts, is to understand the true nature of the country and speak to that truth and give us a more hopeful, positive, optimistic scenario for it. My, life, my wife, Libby, um, made the huge mistake a couple of years ago of attending one of my talks. And afterwards I said, and it was a talk like this, where they, I was asked to go through the problems of the world and the challenges, how we're going to face them. Afterwards I said, so how'd that go? She said, well, I get the problem thing. She said, but you're depressing everybody. <laughs> she said, are you hopeful about anything? This is my ending. I said, you're right. Anybody talking in public life today has to be honest about our challenges, but you've got to give people some hope. And so I actually went to my students. And that year, I think I had 75 students from 23 countries. And I said, email me come into office hours, let's talk in class. What are you millennials from 23 countries hopeful about? This is what I got back from them. They're hopeful about poverty alleviation. We're living, as you all know, in the greatest period of the alleviation of poverty in the history of the human race. China, hundreds of millions of Chinese now in the middle class, 500 million. 300 million Indians, Brazilians in Northeast Brazil, Sub-Saharan Africa, where as recently as two years ago, six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world were in Sub-Saharan Africa. May that continue. Second, they said we're hopeful about science and our ability to apply science to public policy challenges like public health. So we are just about, we the human race, to eradicate polio. In three to five years, it exists only in three countries and distant villages. Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. We have not eradicated a human disease since smallpox, and we're just about to eradicate polio. And Bill Gates came to Harvard four years ago and said he thought in his lifetime, and he's a young man, 63 years old, he said he thought we could eradicate malaria, which is a major killer of kids, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And think of the promise of Jimmy Carter working on river blindness. We are doing amazing things to improve the public, the lives of people all around the world. That's the second thing. And third, and this is really an ode to Kendall Square, and Silicon Valley, and Austin, Texas, Research Triangle, North Carolina. My students said what they were really hopeful about was the future. That ideas of engineers and scientists 
the looming digital economy, the better angels of the artificial intelligence coming our way, that that could be combined with business, with entrepreneurialism, with private equity and venture capital to produce a cure for cancer, a carbon-free society, a better life, and a better society. My students are optimistic about the future. And I think that's what we need to fall back on. We're facing big challenges, but nothing like the revolution, nothing like the War of the Southern Rebellion, nothing like the Second World War. We just need the right leadership, not to be fearful, not to try to instill that in us, but just to unite us, call upon, as Lincoln said, the better angels of our natures to guide us forward. Thank you very much. So let's talk. Um, questions, ideas, disagreements make all this better. Yes, please. And we have mics coming down. We have a couple of questions in the front row. And this is my friend Dottie's going to. I did not plant this question, did I, Dottie? <laughs> Since we graduated uh, 39 years or whatever it was, 40 years ago. So the question is, um, Dottie Duffy uh, saying that great leaders need to unite us. How can citizens participate in this exercise to try to find our way forward? I'm paraphrasing uh, amidst all these challenges. And it means that we have to defend our democracy and fight and peacefully, civilly for our democracy. And boy, have we seen that. We had a hard-fought campaign. That was good. My side lost, but we accept the victor. We hope for the victor's success. We pray for his success. And then when he stumbles or he says something or does something with which we disagree, we write letters. And we go on Facebook and Twitter. And we write Congressman Joe Kennedy and Congressman Seth Moulton and our other great rep, Catherine Clark, Cambridge. And we march on Washington and participate as a lot of people here, men and women, women and men did in the Women's March. Um, and we run for office. And we stand up and say we disagree. And we hope our justices follow their hearts and minds. And we honor the press and not demonize the press. And we preserve our democracy, and we will. And we've been through much tougher problems than this. For those of you who agree with me that we're facing tough times, if you're a Donald Trump supporter, you do all those things on your side. And our democracy wins. And so I think, I think this is, I think this is a, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a pessimistic time. Because I really think the strength of the American people are going to shine forth. In these various debates we're going to have, do we want a clean energy future? Do we want an environmental protection agency to protect us from what's happening in the atmosphere or who's polluting our lakes and streams from the ravages of unbridled capitalism? Gets back to Galbraith, government's a countervailing power to the private sector. That's just one example. So I'm hopeful. I think the people are going to emerge successful. But boy, it's challenging. And we probably haven't had a time like this since the Vietnam War. A lot of Ken Burns' incredible film is not just the battles over there, it's the battles here that a lot of us, we were kind of young. We came along just at the tail end of the Vietnam War. But we remember. And those were democratic civil battles that honored our democracy. And the people spoke. So I assume that's what's going to happen this time. Great question. Yes, sir. We'll just start in the front row and pass the mic down. Or Mic's on. You focused on a number of the challenges of the testing, as you yourself said, there are many challenges beyond that. I see very little uh, in the press 
about potential solutions. And I'm going to ask you about one particular area of the conflict. Fair enough. Much of it is, and that is our uh, imminent face off with North Korea. In your view, does China have the leverage uh, to do something substantial to ameliorate the situation? And if so, what combination of leverage and or concessions might the U.S. be prepared to uh, engage in uh, to get China to apply that leverage? Thanks for the softball question. I really appreciate it. But it's, it's a great question. So the question on North Korea, what do we do? Does China have leverage? Do we fight or negotiate? I think if you, if you ask Donald Trump and Barack Obama together, what's the most significant problem we face, the most dangerous problem right now, they'd say North Korea, the most dangerous problem. Because here's the situation. You have a country armed to the teeth, more than a million men and women in uniform, uh, a kind of a Tony Soprano type family running it in a mafia <laughs> dictatorship. And nobody in our government has ever met a 33-year-old with no prior employment or management experience who now runs the country and owns a nuclear weapons program. And the only American of note, you know where I'm going with this, <laughs> who's kind of hung out with him, is a really good ex-basketball player, Dennis Rodman, but probably not the guy you want to negotiate <laughs> nuclear weapons. The specific problem is this. He has nuclear weapons. He's threatened to use them against our allies, South Korea, and the American forces there. He's threatened to use them against Japan. Last summer, this was like out of the twilight zone of the Cold War, the North Korean state spokesperson said, we're going to incinerate New York, incinerate it, and kill everyone in the city. Who talks like that anymore? A nihilistic leader, someone who is possessed of his own glory and is so fearful of everyone else that he's created a hermit kingdom, and that's what North Korea is. So what do we do about it? The options to use military force are exceedingly limited. He has nuclear weapons. We saw last week in this extraordinary military parade on the 105th anniversary of Kim Il-sung, the grandfather, the founder of North Korea in the 1940s, they have mobile ICBMs. So if you think their X number of ICBMs are in these certain places and silos, if you're wrong, and two or three of them are on, a so are on a mobile launcher, and it's a solid fuel launcher, not a liquid fuel, so you don't have to spend much time raising that platform and firing the missile, if you're wrong, you might start World War III. I think we cannot think about the use of military force. It would be irresponsible, it would be criminal of us to take the chance that we ignited by accident a nuclear war and that's what's at stake. So where does that leave us? It leaves us where President Obama had been arguing with the Chinese and where President Trump has started. And now let me say some nice things about President Trump because he deserves it. He deserves praise from his opponents when he does things that I think, that we think are the national interest. I think he's doing the right thing here. He sent a carrier battle group to North Korea to basically say, we're going to defend our ally, South Korea. He sent Vice President Pence up to the DMZ the other day to say, we're going to defend South Korea. Make no mistake. Don't think we're a paper tiger. We will defend South Korea. Effective deterrence. He's also said, China, Donald Trump, Mar-a-Lago, his dinner and breakfast with Xi Jinping, if you want a good relationship with us, Beijing, then you have to help us contain this, this problem because you're the only country that has leverage, your word, great word. And China supplies the food to North Korea, it's the poorest country on, the earth, on earth, and it buys the coal and provides other energy to North Korea to keep the lights on. North Korea cannot survive without China. So Donald Trump is pushing Xi Jinping, help yourself and help me by containing this 33-year-old and his nuclear weapons force. It's logical, it's smart, I think the president's right to do it, I'm supporting him on this. The only problem is, to answer your question, I don't think China's actually going to do it. Because the Chinese prefer the status quo than an alternative, which be, would be if you pressure North Korean too much, if there's famine because you don't supply the food, or they, don't, they can't run their economy because you don't supply the energy, if North Korea dissolves, 
There are potentially millions of North Korean refugees. They'll go north into China, and that's south into South Korea. And if the state dissolves, then there's a reasonable proposition that the Korean Peninsula will be united, much like Germany was in 1990, under one country, a government in Seoul, aligned with the United States, we're a military ally, and China fears that scenario more than the present scenario. So the one minor criticism I'd have of the president, and he's just, this is hard, and he's just trying to feel, I'm sympathetic to him, feel his way forward here is, he's been saying on Twitter, I read him every morning, <laughs> uh, because that's how you know what he's thinking. 7 a.m., the tweets come over. I'm one of his 26 million followers. Um, he's been saying, China's going to resolve this for us. I don't think China is. I think China's going to disappoint us. As they disappointed Barack Obama, as they disappointed George W. Bush, as they disappointed Bill Clinton. Where does that leave us? It leaves us with protecting our allies, maintaining our military strength, and at some point, bargaining with the devil. My friend Bob Benukin, with whom I teach, he's a law school professor at Harvard, has written a book. A lot of our most significant negotiations are with people and regimes we don't like. But you negotiate because, as Yitzhak Rabin said, you don't negotiate with your best friends on war and peace. You negotiate with your enemies. That's how Rabin justified shaking Arafat's hand on the White House lawn in September 1993 during the Oslo peace process. That's what we're going to have to do. And maybe the best deal we can get with China, Japan, South Korea, and Russia helping us is to freeze the North Korean nuclear program in place and hope for a better day. And that's about as a good a scenario as I can paint. This is a really tough problem. It may be harder than Syria, which is the second tough problem. It's certainly more dangerous because I haven't told you the really bad news. Within three to five years, a lot of our best people think that North Korea will have an ICBM that can hit Washington, Oregon, California, and our Rocky Mountain states. And that is an unacceptable proposition that that kind of regime could launch a nuclear attack on the west coast of the United States. So President Trump is right to dive into this. He's right to pressure China. We should support him. I'm supporting him so far. And I hope he's successful. But success might be very limited some kind of unsavory deal. Thus is the complexity of global politics. Please. And a mic is coming right over the top to you. Well, you, you, you if, if you would uh, speak to the mic because we have cameras, so for the... That's okay. I, I'll, um, I'll repeat your question. I'm sure at the time, all of you, you support At the time that even 10 years ago, you that was a disaster and was not good. Because Saddam was your own agent. You sent it to Iran, eight years more, millions of people, chemical weapons, that the, they also the music on the Iranian, you never talk about that. Only court because you are using court now. Court is the darling now. But uh, also, did you talk a lot about uh, your government and strong government? But you go around and talk about it. You are not the force of democracy. You are the uh, top of all these democratic people that you know the government that democratically were elected. Number of them. You have shield. Hundreds of leaders, okay, and you know, in the name of democracy. So, what is behind all these wars that are raging is really a plan, a vicious plan. It's going on for more than a century. As your uh, uh, that is CFO in the Council on Foreign Relations, that uh, uh, funded by Paul Warber and also uh, Rockefeller, they said. We are going to erect world government. You like it or not, and come to us, or uh, you know that the, the Do you, I'm happy to have a conversation with you after the session, but why don't you ask a question and I'll answer it. Remember that war criminal 
said that they are going to attack after Afghanistan, but we never showed that Afghanistan actually was behind it. We are going to push you the I'm, I'm happy to reply to you if you'd like me to. Why do you go around and trouble countries after countries and you fail them? Syria did not have a terrible attack. Sit down, please, okay? Ma'am? Sir? I'll be happy to answer your question. Uh, let me let me just answer your question. I'll come to you, okay? I'm I'm trying to. I'll answer your question. Ma'am, I'm happy to I'm happy I'm happy to answer your question. I'm happy to answer your question. Well, it was a well. Let me just say this. Uh, no. <laughs> so, listen. Can I just say, ma'am? Can I just say, you have a? Can I just say to you? Can I just say to you? I'm happy to try to answer. You, you raise a lot of issues. I'll, I'll, I'll address the Iraq War. I'll be happy to do. I'll be happy to do that. You have a right to speak. You have a right in our democracy to speak, and no one would say you don't. And so, and so, <laughs> so let me answer your question about Iraq. And let me tell you that uh, I was ambassador to NATO during the Iraq War. I supported the war. I supported the war in my mind, and I supported it as a diplomat for our government. Um, I deeply regret my support for the war. I, one of the things that one is able to do when you leave government is to look back. I think we as a society have looked back to March in 2003. If you look at our public opinion polls, the polls at the time, and the majority in Congress at the time, supported the war. The polls now, the majority of our elected leaders, the great majority, oppose it. Looking back with greater wisdom, uh, recognizing the mistakes that we made. What were the mistakes? Uh, we did not anticipate the occupation. Sounds basic. We thought we'd go in, topple the government, and basically leave. And that Iraqis would run. That's not what we did. We went in and fired the Ba'athist party, fired the military, drove the Sunnis out of government, largely, the Sunni officer class. We tried to run the country for a year on our own, then eight years in total, and it was a, uh, it was a failed enterprise. Lots of people dead on the Iraqi side. Lots of people dead, 4,500 Americans dead, 25,000, 30,000 wounded. A million Iraqis, perhaps, lost their lives. So I look back at it and I deeply regret it. I hope that we've learned from it. I think if you look at some of the public reaction to when our presidents, President Obama, President Trump, have said, let's use force, people have mixed feelings about using force. Bob Gates, our defense secretary, who came after Secretary Rumsfeld, said when he left in 2011, he said the next American Secretary of Defense who counsels an American president to put a major land army into Asia should, or the Middle East should have his head examined. I think we've learned a lot. You're right to raise the question. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards about the other issue you've, you've raised. But here's how complex this is. My students and I, I, I teach a course uh, called Great Powers. Uh, in the autumn and this winter, I've been at Harvard Business School. We did a case study on the Iraq War 2003. And nearly all my students, and I certainly believe it was a mistake, but we left 
in 2011. And when we left, the Iraqis weren't ready to fulfill the responsibilities of governing. Not their fault, difficult situation. And who took our place? The Islamic State. And now we're back in Iraq with about 6,000 special forces and flight crews to try to fight the Islamic State at the request of the Iraqi government. So we were left in my class two semesters running with the following takeaway conclusion. We were probably, I think, certainly wrong to go in. We may have been wrong to leave. Look, Secretary Powell, Colin Powell, a really smart, wise person, used to say publicly, beware the pottery barn rule. The pottery barn rule in global politics is you break it, you own it. Well, we broke Iraq. You're right, we overthrew the government. A lot of people died. And then we just left in the relatively short period of eight years. And think, you know, we've been in Germany since 1945, we've been in Japan since 45, still, at the request of those governments. After eight short years, the Islamic State came in with their depravity and evil, and now we're back in. These are complex questions. We wrestle with them. We try to do our best. We did not do our best, obviously, in the Iraq War. And let me just exclude a class of people. The military did their best and we have to honor their service. They were ordered to go in, they did their job. Civilians, like me, bear responsibility for that decision. Yes, way up at the back. Please, yeah. Right, uh, the question is about Yemen and whether or not the United States has complicity in the indiscriminate bombing of the Saudi and Emirati, largely those two countries, air campaign against the Houthi rebels. This is a sectarian war. It's a power struggle. The Saudis and Iranians are opposing each other for supremacy in the Muslim world. Uh, the Iranians are punching a hole into the Sunni world. Think where they are. They're the kingpins in Baghdad. They're the kingpins in Damascus. Revolutionary Guard forces of Iran are on the ground fighting against the Sunni militias on behalf of the Alawite government in Syria. They're in Lebanon. They invented Hezbollah, and they arm and encourage Hezbollah, and they're arming Hamas, and they're gearing up for the next rocket war against Israel. If I brought my map, you'd see there's a connectivity, a physical connectivity for missile shipments from Iran into Syria, into Lebanon, into Gaza. And the victims of this are the Sunni states and the Israelis. And so the Saudis have formed a Sunni coalition to try to defend the Sunni world against the Shia power, Iran. And that is happening, the epicenter in your question, in Yemen. And I do think it's deeply misguided of the Saudis and Emiratis to launch these bombing campaigns in civilian neighborhoods. Tens of thousands of people have been killed, and yet it's on page 64B of our newspapers. We never read about it. And yet it's a great, terrible human drama, and the United States is supporting, supplying a lot of the weaponry. And I think our government should question the wisdom of that policy, at least try to restrain the Saudis and Emiratis, because they appear, appear to be in a perpetual war that cannot be totally won against a strong, and I have no love for the Houthi rebels and no love whatsoever for the Iranian government. I oppose the Iranian government, but we have to be smart about how we counter them. So I think that is a reasonable question to ask the Trump administration and the Obama administration before it. Is it really smart to do this? And aren't a lot of civilians being killed? We are also right to oppose what the Russians and Syrians have been doing in Idlib province in northern Syria and in Aleppo with their indiscriminate bombing and the use of sarin gas 50 times the use of chemical weapons against civilians in Syria. This is the bloodiest conflict in the world today in Syria. The bloodiest conflict in the world today. It's blown apart the state. And at some point we're going to have to turn back, just as in North Korea, to diplomacy 
to strike some messy, unsavory deal just to stop the fighting because there isn't a brilliant solution to this. So thank you for asking that question. Yes, please. It's a really great question. Why are China and Russia vetoing resolutions of the Security Council on a humanitarian basis just to get food and medical supplies into the affected, largely Sunni populations of um, eastern and northern Syria where the rebel groups are still active? And the answer is that um, I think, but more importantly, many people now in government think, especially in Europe, that the Syrian government is guilty of war crimes. That at the end of this conflict, whenever it comes, a war crimes tribunal is going to have to be established because that government bears complicity in massacres of its own people. The, the Russians and Chinese are protecting the Syrian government in the Security Council. You can understand, in a way, why they protect them on a negotiating strategy, on some difference of opinion with us. But humanitarian quarters, sending in relief organizations, helping NGOs to help the people, the Syrians and Russians have been bombing the relief columns of the United Nations itself. And Ban Ki-moon has spoken out very courageously against uh, what the Russians and Syrians are doing. So thank you for your question. The answer has to lie in Moscow and Beijing. There may be a difference between them. The Russians are locked in, and they want to be the major power in Syria. They're not going to change. Chinese are more sophisticated. The Chinese don't want to have, I think, this guilt uh, on their historical record, it may be that the Trump administration could divide China from Russia. That would be a strategy in the Security Council. That could bear fruit. But I agree very much with, with, the, with your question. I think we can do one more question. Okay. This woman has a microphone. Fine. Thank you. You spoke about uh, leadership. Uh, well, I'll take two. I'll take this question and then your question, and, we'll, and that'll be it. Thank you. No, please go ahead, and then we have a. Please. Yeah. You, you spoke about leadership, and I'm interested in asking you about followership. Uh, what happened here, I think, in many ways, is a resonant with what's happened with Brexit, what's happening with Marine Le Pen in France and other countries. And my question for you is whether uh, this is a signal or a sign that we should be paying more attention to the very nature, structural nature, of our democracies. What a brilliant question. Um, and the answer is yes, of course. And I think the biggest battles are going to be here on the immigration and refugee ban. We're fighting that battle. Uh, many of us have joined a, a friend of the court brief to try to block it. Standing up to defend freedom of the press, as we've talked about. Hoping that our government doesn't congratulate an authoritarian leader on a failed election in Turkey. Anti-democratic election, as President Trump did on Sunday. Um, <coughs> fighting the battle for democracy here at home, peacefully, civilly, as I've said before. Yes, I think the real battle is here. Uh, it'll be at the, at the polling booths in by-elections, but also in 2018 and 2020. That's where it should be. Yes? Great school. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question to end on, and we're going to end with some hope here on two respects. I really think a case can be made that Donald Trump wants to be successful. Of course he does. He wants to be successful, and that uh, the Bannon faction was taking him in an entirely different direction than the Kushner faction. And the way to be successful in Washington is to respect the Congress, work with it, respect the press, not alienate allies, and we've seen a different Trump in the last 10 days. Now it's only 10 days. Uh, you know, a lot can happen day to day. But I think we who have opposed him, I have, have a responsibility to say thank you, we support you, we support you on North Korea, give him some encouragement. And he'll be hopefully an adaptive president, as many of our presidents have had to be. I think both Barack Obama and Bill Clinton would say there were better presidents at the end than they were at the beginning. And let's hope that that's what happens with President Trump, and we, sh we, should, we should hope for that. Second, we do at the Kennedy School, we're very focused on how do we make democracies work. Because if you think about Brexit and Marine Le Pen and right-wing populism and the populism in our own country and sometimes the authoritarianism that comes out in our political system, it's all about making democracies work better. And I'll leave you with this note. Uh, tomorrow we're going to commemorate the centennial of John F. Kennedy. He was born in May 1917. Ambassador Caroline Kennedy is coming to speak at the Kennedy School tomorrow. Uh, and Kennedy, for many of us, is the reason we're in public service, those of us of a certain age. Um, and for all of his flaws and mistakes, his brilliance was to believe that government and public service can be ennobling, it can lift us up, that democracy at the city council level and democracy at the UN and democracy in Washington is among the most important human endeavors that any of us will ever engage in and that we should ask our brightest young people to seek public service when in the last couple of decades that's not been the signaling from our schools or even our communities. And so tomorrow we're going to try to rekindle the spirit of President Kennedy in, in the panel that I'm chairing that has Ambassador Kennedy on it. Uh, we're going to show some clips of a great luminous speech he gave at the American University in June 1963 where eight months after the Cuban Missile Crisis he reflects on the near miss of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he basically says, we have to make our peace with the Soviet Union. This is the height of the Cold War. We have to look at them and see the human qualities of the Soviet people and not demonize them. And then he said something really profound. He said, the national interest is important, but the human interest, that has to be ascendant. And that wonderful phrase that I can't repeat from memory and should, but you know, we all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future, and we're all mortal. We're in this together. Um, and so I think your question is a beautiful question to end on because government can be good and it can raise us up. But we, we in our democracy are responsible for the workings of that system and for its lifeblood. And may we be ever active citizens in pursuit of it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. It was quite a night, I think, and we saw his diplomatic, unflappable character.